Now it's official. Good evening. Good to see each of you tonight. We're glad that you are here. And um, if you are with family, that is a, a special uh, welcome. Lots of uh, movement uh, this week with the holidays. Tomorrow being Thanksgiving. Some of you have traveled perhaps here. Some of you will be traveling in other places. I, I really didn't know what our audience would look like tonight um, because of the, the holidays and people moving around, but uh, glad that you're with us. We'll do our study tonight in 2 Timothy, beginning in chapter 2, and uh, those of you who are visiting to our class, we'll just pick you up in the middle and, uh, and run. Uh, we're in the middle of a discussion that Paul is having with his young protege, and uh, we'll include you in that discussion tonight. At the conclusion of our service, we'll have a number of announcements describing the uh, ongoing events and people things we need to know about, but uh, we'll save that conversation uh, for that point. Um, let's begin in prayer, and we'll do our study for the night. Father, we're grateful for the day. We are thankful for life and for every blessing. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to enjoy the country that we live in, for the many blessings that come our way because of the bounty of others, because of the sacrifice of those who've gone before, because of your providence. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be gathered here in this place with our friends and family, our brothers and sisters. We pray that your blessings will be upon each of us Father, we ask that your blessings will be upon those who are traveling this week, that you'll provide them safety to and from their destinations. Help us, Father, to be thankful for all of the blessings that we have in life, and that blessing list is extensive. Father, we ask that you will go with us through this night, that you'll forgive us of our sins, watch over those who have special needs and provide for them. Father, we ask that you will bless us in this life, and when our time is complete, bring us home. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Before we begin with uh, an immediate discussion here at the Maysville folks, I'll say uh, welcome to those who may be gathered in other places. I think there's a few in Henderson uh, tonight, maybe watching our uh, activities and joining in with us, and uh, probably other places. It is a, a good thing if you have found yourself at home uh, sick or in the hospital or unable to attend because of family or, or other inconvenience um, to be able to tune into our services and we hope that you will continue to take advantage of that. Second Timothy chapter 2. Let's start reading in the 14th verse. Our discussion will begin later down in verse 20. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work." If this was the first time you read through this material, quickly you pick up on the fact that Paul mentions several times about staying away, shunning, uh, not striving, not fighting uh, over words and arguments of various kinds. I don't know any more than you do about the world that Timothy lived in. The scriptures give us the best picture of uh, life for Christians at that time. We have some, some secular works that give us some insight into life uh, that they live, but the, the letters that Paul wrote are the most significant in informing us. 
And it's clear that Timothy had some challenges that he had to deal with. There were people challenges. There were doctrinal challenges. Uh, it was possible for him to, to get astray into um, arguing about things that were unimportant. And Paul gives several uh, warnings concerning that. And as we concluded last week in our discussion, uh, spending a good bit of time in the 19th verse, where uh, God says, here's the... Here's the certainty. I know who my, my people are. Paul said it is a certain, a solid foundation that the Lord knows those who are his. And the second part of that is that those who are going to name the name of Christ, who are going to be part of God's kingdom, they must make themselves pure. They must leave, forsake iniquity, that which is unclean. That makes us ready to begin with the 20th verse. Paul uses a discussion of, an, of vessels. Now that's not... Uh, a common word for us to be using any longer. If we were going to be describing this, and I'm not sure we could do it absolute justice, uh, we might talk about pots and pans. Not a perfect analogy, but it would be one uh, that was suitable. In, uh, in your house, you have a variety of things that hold stuff. I have a flower can in my pantry I should say, Libby has a flower can in her pantry um, that, uh, that had Charles's chips in it originally. Um, my mother had a flower can that was not very different from that. Families tend to have similar traits. Um, there are other containers scattered around the kitchen. Some have sugar, some have uh, liquids of various kinds. Your house has its own storage. You go into your kitchen and you're going to have, some of them are decorated, some of them aren't. Open up your refrigerator and it's going to be full. I was thinking a while ago when I stepped up here, I said, I wonder how many pies will be, uh, will be represented by the folks who gathered here. If we ask, how many pies are at your house? At your house, th there would be a lot of pies. We start talking about how many, how many buckets of this, how many bags of that, how many uh, receptacles of, of whatever. You have a lot of stuff in your house. You get in the kitchen, you've got things that are uh, very valuable. Some of them because they have sentimental value from family. Others because they have some other value. You use them. You wouldn't get a bucket out of the garage that you'd been uh, throwing trash into and bring it in the house and pour good, clean milk in it, would you? No, you wouldn't. You understand that there is in your kitchen vessels for honor and vessels for dishonor. There are, there are bowls and plates and, and pans that you're going to use and they are valuable to you and you're going to use them to... Cook in today, tomorrow, you'll be serving in, in special containers. You've got your own special spoons. You've got the spatulas you like the best. You have, Paul's describing the illustration and says, in God's house, in a big house, you've got many vessels. Some are honorable, others are not. What makes the difference? Well, the difference is what you're going to use them for, but how do you decide what you're going to use them for. On more than one occasion, I have come to the kitchen when Libby was home. That's the best way to do it without getting in trouble. And ask, do you have something I can take to the garage? And sometimes she'll ask, am I going to get it back? Probably. Sometimes she'll ask, am I going to want it back? Depends on what it is. If it's stainless steel, it'll clean up great. If it's plastic, it's a goner. <laughs> So, what are you going to do? In God's house, what kind of vessel are you? What would God use you for if you were a pot or a bucket? Would you be a trash can? Or would you be the, the clean, prepared bowl getting ready for some uh, special jello salad on Thanksgiving Day? We decide something of that for ourselves. In a great house, actually the translation of the word uh, that is translated great house, you would recognize it right off. Mega, megas, big. 
in the big house. Lots of vessels. Now, the, uh, our house probably doesn't have gold and silver that we use regularly. But you remember in the time that, that Paul was writing, you had a big stretch between that which was, was valuable and would be useful every day and that which was common. Um, they didn't have stainless steel bowls. They didn't have aluminum. If you were going to use metal, there were not very many options. Uh, so the majority of your, your, um, your kitchenware would have been out of either wood or clay, pottery. And um, the wood does not render artifacts very well, but pottery does. And that's one of the things that archaeologists use to date various stratas of, uh, of digs is what kind of pottery remains are there. Well, this was common. Gold and silver, that's too valuable for it to be left around lying in the dirt. Those things are gathered up as treasures. So you have this real break between those things that are really valuable and honorable and those that are just disposable. What an interesting contrast. And if we make the analogy then to, to us as human beings, like Paul is doing to Timothy, a... a if anyone, verse 21, cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Good question we could ask ourselves is maybe what are we made of? Wood, you're going to throw away. Clay, replaceable. Gold and silver, those are treasures. It's not the only time the concept of vessels comes up in use but this vessel discussion and we'll go into it a little farther in a moment in the 18th chapter of the book of Jeremiah there's another very interesting Old Testament analogy let's read if you'd like to I'm going to trip back to uh, Jeremiah 18 start with the first verse the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now, the potter vision that uh, we read here in Jeremiah 18 is not the same concept that Paul is describing in 2 Timothy. The image that, that Jeremiah is seeing is he has been sent down to watch the, the craftsman at work as he is making a, a, a clay pot. He has his clay on the wheel and, uh, and, and he's making it. But as the, as the vessel is formed, a, a, a bowl, perhaps a vase or some, some other uh, device, it, it is, it, it's, it's not formed properly. There's something wrong with it. And so the, the potter mashes it all back down and he starts over again to make something else. So what was going to be is not going to be any longer. The message that Jeremiah was to carry to Israel is, God is forming you, and if you do not respond properly, he'll start over. He'll form you into something else. And there will be a conversation later. Shall the potter say to, or shall the pot say to the potter, you made me wrong. God is going to do what he wants with his vessels. But now Paul's message is not about what God is going to do, but what about we do for ourselves, and whether or not we make ourselves suitable for the work of God. You see, Paul's message is not about what God gave you, but about what you're going to give God. Therefore, verse 21, if anyone cleanses himself, he will be a vessel for honor. You see, the message that Paul is bringing to Timothy is you've got a choice to make in your life. And your choice is going to be how you prepare yourself so that you're going to be either something God can use that's valuable or something that God is going to use perhaps that is uh, not as valuable depending on what you're going to do with it. Let's look at a couple of other um, passages. Drop over with me to the book of Titus chapter 1. Let's start reading at verse 15. I've got more pages than I've 
got room, let me move out. Titus 1, 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Titus is being told about people. He said there are people who make choices for themselves in this category. He said the category, the difference is some are pure and some are not pure. To the pure ones, they create pureness around them. To the unpure, there is unpureness around them. There are some who claim to be pure, but they're not. They profess, verse 16, to know God, but in their works, they deny him. And then Paul goes on to say, and by their denial, they make themselves unsuitable for anything good that God could use. Isn't that interesting? Now, that is what Paul is describing in 2 Timothy 2.20. The choices that people make makes them either suitable or unsuitable for the, the work that God will do in their lives. A little farther toward the end of Scripture. Go with me to 1 John. This time we'll start reading in chapter 3. With verse 7. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not continue to sin. For his seed remains in him. He cannot continue to sin because he's been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are being manifested. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not from God, nor is he who does not love his brother. This is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. John says, don't be deceived. And the fact that he calls them little children is not an insult. He's describing them, and especially if we consider um, there is historical information that the apostle John lived to be to a very great age relative to people of the time. So as an old man, uh, it's likely that he was still at work. And for him to address those who are younger as little children is not insulting, but rather in a term of endearment. My little ones. It's possible for us to be deceived by others. It's possible for us to deceive ourselves. And he says, don't let anyone deceive you. The person who is righteous, and a lot of people claim righteousness, the person who is righteous lives righteously. Now, that's a, a direct conflict with what many religious groups teach in their profession that a person who is, in their terminology, elected by God for salvation cannot be lost, that they cannot sin so as to be lost. And the scriptures so commonly refute that idea with absolute clarity. In this, verse 10, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. That is, they're demonstrated, they're shown, they're, they're, they're displayed for all to see. What's the difference? How can we tell the difference? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not from God. When Paul talks to Timothy about preparing himself, he's describing how he needs to clean up. Let's go back to our text. Verse 21. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he'd be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful. T to be sanctified means to be made holy. Vessel of honor is a, a position of service that is going to be admirable and functional and um, something that God will value. Prepared for every good work. In contrast to that, there are those who have been involved with false teachings, uh, that have dealt improperly with the truth. Hymenaeus and Philetus, verse 17, uh, are, are like, and we talked about it last week, verse 17, the word that's translated cancer is gangrene. Uh, they are like a diseased flesh in the body, and, and they are destroying it. Paul says, you are not like that. You're going to clean yourself up. You're going to be pure. 
and suitable for good works. Not contaminated with immorality, not contaminated with false doctrine, but I read one author who described, he said, here's what God is looking for, for the people that he is going to use in his service. They must be, number one, clean. Number two, open or empty, ready to receive. And number three, they must be available. Interesting discussion. Clean, ready to receive, and ready to go. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee youthful lusts. When Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he said, let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. The fact that Paul saw that Timothy was a young man did not disqualify him from serving the Lord. But the fact that Timothy was young meant that he had to take special precaution not to act in the ways that, can, that bring down or trouble those who are young. What are youthful lusts? I'm pause there and, and uh, let you weigh in if you'd like. What are youthful lusts? It's one of two options. Either you don't know or you don't want to say. If we talk about a category, we're talking about those things that, that youth would have trouble with. Are there things that young people are bothered with that, that older people are simply not bothered with? As you get older, I wouldn't know since I'm only younger. As you get older, sorry, I couldn't resist. Are there things you simply don't want to do anymore that you may have wanted to do when you were younger? Actually, that's not true. I remember years ago, uh, and it's been a long time ago. Um, we had the, uh, the teenagers, and we'd taken them to Six Flags, and we had rented a bus. And we had hired a, a gentleman to drive us over there. And so uh, in preparation for it, I made sure that I had a ticket for him, and we got over there, and I said, I've got you this ticket to come into Six Flags. And he said, not interested. I said, how are you going to spend your day? He said, I'm going to sleep on the bus. And I remembered walking myself back in. I'm going, when I get so old that I'd rather sleep on the bus as go into Six Flags, I need to not be here anymore. So, let me finish my story. I'll come back to that. The last time I went to Six Flags, we had problems with the, with the vehicle and had a tire that blew out. And so it needed to be serviced before we could go back. So I volunteered to take the vehicle over and get the new tire put on. I got back. And it took quite a bit of the day to, to, to get it all arranged. And I'm sitting out the parking lot and you're going, you know what? I'd rather lay back here and take a nap as go in there to Six Flags. Carrie? Uh, I don't remember you being there. No. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, obvious uh, challenges that young men have when it comes to opposite sex early. Solomon had a lot to say about that, you know, if you read through, and it often talks about a young man. Yes, he did. caught in the snare, and Timothy's a young man. So that's, yes, not, is. that's an obvious challenge at that age to uh, conduct yourself and associate yourself with the right folks with the opposite sex. So that's one thing, obviously, that would be uh, come up first or early in the list. It certainly is. And uh, I won't springboard off of this too far, but um, there is a new problem. It's an old problem, but it's a new problem. A new problem that has, has been sprung upon our young folks growing up. And that is the problem of pornography. Now, I suppose that the concept of pornography has been around as long as you had things that would take pictures of, uh, of other objects. And before that, you had the real thing you could always uh, look at. But it was a little difficult to arrange all of that. 
Now, when I was being raised or growing up as a young one, uh, pornography was uh, something that you would buy perhaps in a magazine. Um, they were available, certainly, at every uh, corner uh, convenience store, but was not really accessible uh, to young people. Today, it's different. Every teenager who's got a cell phone or access to a computer has got instant access to pornography. Not just a little bit, but a lot. And not just like you used to see perhaps in uh, what would be considered tame magazines of 30 years ago. This is much more difficult. And it is a huge problem in our world. Um, and it's not just confined to the problem of youth. I read a discussion from a, uh, the, let me get the, the letters right, uh, the Lawyers Associate, Divorce Lawyers Association uh, of America, I think, DLAA. Um, and they talked about the role that pornography is playing in the number of divorces that are taking place. And what was interesting was one of the authors who was writing the article I was reading said, this was not an issue that we had to deal with 15 years ago. This is a new problem. Well, that's, it's a new problem. But there are things that, that young people have that, that threaten their well-being that you grow out of it to some degree. Well, Paul was warning him and others that uh, the youthful lust, the things that, that appeal to us uh, while we're young, stay away from those. Now, the word that is flee, and there are several phrases that, that Paul uh, uses. Verse 16, shun profane, idle, and babblings. Um, Verse 22, flee youthful lust. Verse 23, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. There are several times where Paul is going to describe the concept of there's something bad here and you need to push it away. You need to stand separate from it. Here, the word that is translated flee um, literally means to, to turn and run. But the opposite of that Flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness. The word that's translated pursue comes from the Greek word that means to chase after intently with an intent to catch. Uh, so it's not just a, a, a race, but rather you are after it hard. What are we going to pursue? We pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Well, if I had not just preached a sermon recently on back to basics and uh, had taken on several of those terms, uh, we would pursue them a little more diligently, but, uh, but we did. But then look at the last part of that uh, 22nd verse. Pursue these things with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, when, uh, when Paul says, you pursue these along with them, what does that mean? That we, that we have to be together with them? No, but rather that there are those who are pursuing God just like this. You want to be with them. You can count those who are doing this. And when we're all doing the same, then that puts us into a situation, surely, of fellowship. The opposite of that. If we're going to pursue one thing and flee from another, there are things that we need to stay away from. Verse 23, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. What is a foolish and ignorant dispute? I suppose it depends on if you're asking the question or trying to answer it. Um, there are some topics that simply cannot be answered. And um, you can argue about them. Um, and when we get through, you'll have a lot of conversation. But uh, there will be no solution. There are some topics that are going to cause a fight, just bringing them up. And um, Paul says those are foolish. The, the, the concept of foolish is just that which um, brings into our lives. Um, the word that is translated here actually is what the word we get our word moron from. Now, that's not a word you probably go around saying, you moron. It used to be, but... That's on the uh, not approved list, I think, any longer. Um, but the, uh, 
The idea is that anyone who would do this is missing something. This is not intelligent. And the other side of that is, is ignorant. The, the unlearned, uneducated, um, without instruction kind of thing. That, that, um, and Paul says, avoid them. Stay away from them. Knowing they generate strife. There are some questions that as a Bible teacher... I cringe to hear asked because there's no way out J just to touch the topic sometimes is going to lead off into a, uh, a troubling discussion um, there are times where we need to have those discussions but uh, there are certainly topics that need to be avoided they're not going to uh, benefit us how do you know the difference Sometimes experience is going to do that. Sometimes our, um, our age and help from others will help us along. But if you've been around things that you know create trouble, they generate strife, you know those things need to be avoided. Verse 24, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and patient. We're going to avoid foolish and unlearned questions. Why? Because they create strife. And a servant of the Lord, a good teacher, Paul's, remember, our first application of this material is to Timothy, the young man being prepared to go out and do his work, and especially here in 2 Timothy, the last words that he is getting from Paul. If you're going to be doing God's work, and the word that Paul uses here, translated servant, doulos, literally means a slave. That is not politically correct language to be translating into in our modern language. But that's the word Paul uses, doulos. A slave. you owned by God. And so Paul's terminology here, one who is owned by God, does not do that. Must not quarrel. You're not a fighter. It is, the word translated here means gentle or mild, easy to get along with. I'll illustrate it with another passage. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in the seventh verse, Paul is referring to uh, the relationship that he had with the, um, the Thessalonians and how he had come to them how they had provided for them. They're, the beginning goes back as far as verse 5 in 1 Thessalonians 2. Neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, for God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or for others, when we might have made demands as apostles. But verse 7, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. The word that's translated gentle there is the same word Paul uses here. That's how a, a servant of God is supposed to be, gentle. How do you see a mother taking care of her children? Gently. Oh, uh, you say, you haven't seen some of the mothers I've been around. Well, there's a time when children need to be disciplined, but parents still do it with the, the best will of the child at heart, and it's, it's a done with, uh, with a controlled, careful preparation for what the child needs to carry on in life. Gentle, but also able to teach. There's another time this particular phrase is found Able to teach is a description found that is descriptive of the list that Paul puts of elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the second verse, when he describes the qualities that a bishop must have. He must be able to teach. And so Paul here is describing Timothy is going to be one. He's not going to cause a fuss. He's not going to um, be involved in creating drama or strife. He's going to deal gently with people as he teaches them. He's not going to fight. He's going to be a competent teacher. Patient means enduring. We go on to verse 25 because we have uh, another list here that continues. Verse 25 and following. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. 
and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken by him to do his will. Now, there are several pieces there. One, humility. Um, what was the song years ago? You probably can sing it along with me. A little sacrilegious, perhaps. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. You remember that song? You at least heard it. What is humility? Humility is the, uh, is the quality of being able to deal with other people without arrogance, without condescension, uh, without thinking too highly of yourself. It is the subject of Paul's discussion in Philippians chapter 2 when he says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought, but instead value others better than yourself. If you value others better than yourself, then you are going to be saved from the, uh, the trap of, of arrogance. Humbly correcting those who are in opposition. Now, depending on what your translation that you're reading from is, you may have a different phrase there in uh, verse 25. King James Version translates this phrase, those who oppose themselves. The New King James Version translates this just simply in the, in the blank, correcting those who are in opposition. Uh, many of the modern speech translations, NIV and others, uh, translate this, those who oppose you. Well, which one is it? The people who are fighting Timothy? The people who are oppositionally, period, or the people who are opposing themselves? Well, for uh, just a moment, let me take us into a Greek study. The uh, translation of this word, the verb that's translated here, opposing, comes from the middle voice. And so it is one that is acting upon itself. The King James Version actually is the best translation here. Those who oppose themselves. Who opposes themselves? Have you ever heard anyone described as they're their own worst enemy? They are harming themselves by what they're doing. Well, Paul is describing these individuals who are harming themselves by their opposition to God. There's no one going to get hurt by the sinner as much as the sinner. The person who is living in sin is going to pay the highest price. They are going to ultimately pay, pay with their soul. Now, that doesn't mean that others who get in the way aren't going to be harmed along the way. It's certainly the case that someone uh, can get out here and be drunk and, and run over people and cause all kinds of damage. But what kind of damage is it to live in that person's shoes, that person who lives drunk? They're harming themselves with what they do. Now, Paul is describing those who, uh, who are wrong spiritually. They are in opposition. Paul says, you deal gently with them. Why? Because it's possible for you to win the argument and lose the battle. The whole goal that Paul is, has here in mind is that Timothy, by his work and effort, would be able to save the souls of these men and women who were caught up in the devil's trap and tricks. if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. I don't know what it would be like to live up in the Northeast. I've traveled in the Northeast, but I have not lived there. I don't know what it would be like to, uh, to live in California. I don't know what it would be like to live in, in places where um, to bring up the name of God at your workplace or in a school would, would get you in trouble. There are places like that. But they're opposing themselves. They need something. They need truth. They need to have the message of the gospel. When I read and when I hear about things that happen in other parts of the world, do you, you know what happened recently in Paris? What was wrong with those people? What was the problem? You know what the real problem is? They don't have God. 
Now, despite the fact that perhaps we could go back and we could talk about uh, Ireland and uh, the difficulties that, that happened between various factions and the fightings that went on there, as a rule, people who go generally under the name of Christian, regardless of how they might define that term, don't run around blowing people up. It, it just doesn't happen. And part of the problem with those who are involved in such treacherous acts against humanity is that what they are pursuing as religious truth is leading them down a path of great violence and harm. And perhaps God will grant unto them repentance so that they can, they need to hear the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive to do his will. Um, every once in a while, I'll get an email from someone, and it's obvious that it wasn't sent by the person who sent it. You're going, huh? What are you talking about? Uh, all of you computer folks, you know what I'm talking about. You get an email, and you know that it did not actually come from that person. It was taken or done by a virus or a, a program that there was on their computer, and they don't know anything about it. And sometimes I'll send a note back to the individual, and I'll say, I got a message from your computer. I suspect you didn't send it. You might want to run a virus checker on your program, on your uh, software to make sure it's okay. I'm certain that my, my uh, sister is not listening to this. One of the most hostile responses I ever got was from my sister. She said, didn't do it. I said, I didn't say you did. Your computer did. No, it didn't. Yeah, it did. I got it right here in front of me. Did not. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but it happened anyway. Brothers and sisters can argue in ways that no other one can. It was a fun discussion. If you were going to have a conversation with somebody who was caught by the devil, they didn't believe it, they didn't know it, they've been trapped, they, are, they, they, are, they have lost their mind. Paul says that God may help them to come to their senses. A person who is caught up in sin doesn't really know what they're doing. Well, yeah, they know what they're doing, but they don't know what they're doing. And Paul says, help them. Help them, help them find truth. Help them find the way they should be. You don't beat them over the head. You don't hurl insults. You don't harm them. You, you gently bring them back so that they understand what, what really is valuable. That's right. Yeah, meekness or humility here in this case. Um, and so that attitude goes a long way, I think, toward determining the outcome of the time in your approach. If you found someone, <laughs> there is a, uh, a modern fascination with zombies. <clears throat> um, our young kids, our young people, uh, love the zombie things the the the, uh, the idea that somehow you have a, a a nation of people who are taken over by some other uh sense well uh, and there are several popular shows on television some of them are more spoofish than others but paul describes the concept of spiritual zombieism that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Folks, that sounds like spiritual zombies right there. They've been taken. They don't know they've been taken. They've lost their senses, and they are trapped, and they need to be freed. Interesting picture. And Paul says, Timothy, if you are a vessel of God and you clean yourself, and you prepare yourself for honor, you can do this work, and you will serve God in this way. Our time is gone. Next week, Lord willing, we will continue in chapter 3. Um, and Paul will change to a completely different perspective as he begins to talk about the, the things that are to come. We hope that uh, your holiday plans will be fulfilled 
and your time together with your family, if you have that available, we'll be very blessed. And we're glad to have you tonight if you're visiting with us.